Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to those who are already here. We'll give a few more seconds, not minutes, but seconds for the rest of the uh, of the crew to join us. I know that there are over 100 people who have registered for today, and there'll probably be more who will come along through the course of the, of the webinar. But thank you very much for joining us this morning. My name is Gareth Cliff. It is a pleasure for us at cliffcentral.com to be co-hosting with ABSA a series of what I think are absolutely fundamentally important webinars about something which is uncomfortable to talk about. It's something which we clearly in this country have a major problem with and something where we have corralled together some of the, the best minds and the people with some of the most experience, some of the best ideas around how to deal with, um, with sexual and gender-based violence in South Africa. Today, we're specifically focused on how that works in the workplace. And uh, in order to help me, I will introduce you to our panel in just a moment or two. But while you get in and get comfortable, uh, we will give everybody just a minute or two to make sure that they're ready to go. Uh, this will also be available after the fact, just by the way. So in case you miss any of the, the webinar today, there will be a way for you to watch the video or to listen to it as a podcast straight after we've completed today's recording. So this is obviously live and you will be able to interact with us. So I encourage you please to go onto our chat. If you'd like to do that, it's very easy. The, um, the messages will pop up on the screen here. So I can see any of your comments. If you have um, any questions, if you have things that you'd like to address to a particular person on the panel, you are more than welcome to do that. And hopefully we'll have lots and lots of interaction. I see we already got um, more than half the number of registered people who've come on. So it's going to be quite busy this morning. Uh, we will go for an hour. So I'm going to have to keep it quite disciplined in terms of time. But otherwise, if there are things that require a bit more time, we will obviously make sure that that's available. So uh, once again, my thanks to ABSA for making it possible for, for us to talk about this, um, this very, very important subject. Now, many of us on this webinar today are in a corporate environment where we don't necessarily experience or expect to experience explicit sexual or physical violence. But that's not all we're talking about. Gendered violence exists through discrimination, through coercion, through the denial of freedom and inherent subtle gender-based biases, which we may or may not be aware of. And it's too costly to ignore because a study which was conducted by global audit firm, uh, audit firm KPMG in 2014 found that sexual and gender-based violence costs South Africa between 28 and 42 billion rand a year, or between 0.9 and 1.3% of GDP annually. And it's always hard to turn these things into costs because it sounds insensitive and it sounds like you're reducing it to numbers and each of those is an experience that we should have managed to avoid as a civilized society in 2020. But in reality, these costs are probably even higher as SGBV crimes are severely underreported and multiple data gaps exist. It's almost impossible to quantify intangible costs like the psychological effects of sexual and gender-based violence. And the conclusion of this, the 2014 KPMG report that I mentioned a moment ago is that we still have much more to understand about the true costs of violence, and in particular, this kind of violence in South Africa. It includes health, it includes justice, it includes other service costs, lost earnings, lost revenues, lost taxes, and second generation costs, which are the cost to children who are witnessing and living with violence and increased juvenile and adult crime. So we have much to get into today. And while all of this is very serious, I do think we, uh, we will leave some gaps for us to be human about these things. And we can't all be automatons and try to be, um, be factual and numerical and statistical in our representation of the problem. Um, each of these is also a story. And on that note, I'm very, very happy to have with me today three very, very impressive people indeed. Harmin Buertis, it's a great pleasure to see you, Harmin. Uh, Harmin is the Head of Sustainability and Engagement at a global mining company, Anglo American. She was one of a team who recently developed the company's sustainable mining plan, intended to lead Anglo American's transformation into a global sustainability leader. Now, you may be thinking, well, what has she got to do with what we're talking about today? I'll get to it. She assists a structured process at Anglo-American to think through the potential impacts and opportunities associated with modern mining. And of course, that has changed in leaps and bounds since its origins. In the context of particularly the fourth industrial revolution, in late 2019, Hermin 
led the launch of Anglo-Americans Living with Dignity program, which includes a comprehensive suite of initiatives to tackle SGBV in mines and mining communities, which, as you know, make up an enormous amount of our GDP and also a, num a huge amount of our employment in South Africa. And as a result, she has unbelievable experience there and will no doubt shed some light on it for all of us today. Uh, Andrew Davies joins us. He is a clinical psychologist. He's also the MD of ICAS, which is the Independent Counseling and Advisory Services. I wish we could um, clone you and make many thousands of you, Andrew, because I think if we had more clinical psychologists and counselors in South Africa, we might have many less social problems, but we'll hopefully be able to extrapolate your ideas and your thoughts today, and that'll do more or less the same as if we could clone you. He's providing employee health and wellness solutions to a large and diverse range of companies. Now, Nadine Mather, Nadine, nice to see you, is the senior associate at the dispute resolution team at Bowman Gilfillan. She advises a wide, wide range of clients on employment, uh, related issues including corporate restructuring, restraints of trade, retrenchments, employment equity, employee benefits, independent contractors, and unfair dismissal. So I hope. Nobody who's joined us for the webinar today has already <laughs> had to engage Nadine's services because it sounds like she does a lot of, of very, very important but primarily unpleasant things when it comes to relations between employers and employees. She also drafts employment contracts, policies, and other employment-related agreements. So she's going to help us understand the constructive steps that employers can take to address SGBV in the workplace. That is a, an introduction. I really do want us to just have a conversation, so I haven't prepared a long list of questions. And Hermin, perhaps we can start with you because what you know happens at a big company like Anglo American, you have so many different people from so many different backgrounds, so many different kinds of life uh, that that are suddenly all thrust into the same quite proximate circumstances, and very often this can lead to a lot of of delicate, difficult personal situations and a lot of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, it must be something which a lot of people don't automatically associate with mining, but it is, it is no doubt something that mining has to take much more seriously now than ever before. Um, <clears throat> yeah, hi everyone. Um, thank you for having me and thanks to EPSA for sponsoring this. I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily agree that, that people don't associate it with mining. Um, they do and they don't. They look at a blue chip company like Anglo American and they might think that it's something that we've we've got done and dusted. On the other hand, you look at something as masculine as mining, and and you might automatically think that it goes hand in hand with something like mining. What we've had to do is is something that's quite uncomfortable for us. We we are a proud and old company, and we've had to to admit that we've got a problem. And that's not something that we like to do, that any company likes to do, is stand up and go, yeah, we've got a problem. This is something that happens every day in our company. At the same time, is it? it's a bit naive to imagine that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. If this happens every day in South Africa, can we imagine that in our 53-odd thousand people who work here, it doesn't happen at our operations? And can we imagine that given that 25 odd years ago, it was illegal for women to work underground, that in that very masculine environment, it has just been hunky-dory ever since women became, started to work underground in a very masculine environment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been a very difficult journey for us to accept on the one hand that yes, we do have a problem. And on the other hand, it's actually quite intuitive that we've had a problem all along. So it's, there are no easy answers here, and we'll get into some of the examples of the, the situations you've probably had to deal with um, without getting into too much detail. I think it's important that people know about what sorts of situations have arisen in, a, in an incredibly complex world like the, like the mining environment. But I think, I mean, if you don't mind, uh, cross to Nadine for a second. Nadine, how, how big is this problem in your experience? I mean, I'm not asking you to give a statistical overview of South Africa. But from the, the cases that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and the clients who come to you and the, and the, the companies that need representation or guidance, um, how big do you think gender-based violence is in South African 
corporations. Thank you, Gareth and Bam. It's great to be participating in this podcast today. We have a number of clients and employers that come to us dealing with issues of sexual harassment that take place in the workplace. It has been an issue that has made headlines in South Africa. I think we just saw this past weekend a number of employees making sexual harassment allegations against the managing director of, of Kaya FM, um, mm. where exploitation was, was used um, against women in, in return for professional reward. And this is just one of the examples where our clients and employers deal with the issue in the workplace. It is extremely widespread um, and a business that believes that they're not impacted by gender-based violence in the workplace is actually, <coughs> actually wrong. You will recall there was that Santon shutdown watch that took place last year with a number of individuals that came forward to, to highlight the role that businesses should play in dealing with gender-based violence and the steps employers should take and the protections advised, you know, provided to victims. And I remember one of the placards reading make my safety your business. And the message there was quite clear. Um, there are significant costs for employers involved in it. Um, it's one of workforce reputational damage. So it is, it is widespread. Our clients are dealing with it quite often. And our courts are also grappling, grappling with the issue and are quite fairly unsympathetic to employers that don't deal with the issue. Yeah, again, because we're in such a complex world in South Africa with so many different kinds of people from so many different kinds of backgrounds, we're bound to have uh, a lot of friction where those different magisteria rub against each other. And and I think male-female relations are probably something which we could spend far more than this hour just discussing. So on that note, I think it's probably worth us asking Andrew about his experience in terms of not just what the symptoms are of of sexual and gender-based violence in the workplace, because it's it's sort of, it's reached far more than a critical level when it also starts spilling over into the workplace. Usually people try to keep work and play separate, and I don't mean play in any uh, fickle way here. I'm, I'm obviously referring to, you know, the relations between people and the things that might or might not happen. And we know that in households, we have a problem. But for people to allow that to actually spill over into the workplace is, is obviously a sign that it's reached dangerous proportions. And Andrew, the symptoms of this are evident because we see the, the the numbers, the police statistics, among others. We hear from people like Nadine, what she's just told us now. Hanmin can t no doubt tell us about what happens at, uh, at at every day level or perhaps every week level in a, in a big mining business where thousands of people are employed. But what is the disease if these are all symptoms? What does this actually come from and, and what is it about South African society that makes us such outliers in terms of the world's statistical evidence for, for gender-based violence, and, and particularly in this case, obviously, against women? Thank you, and, and uh, really appreciate you highlighting uh, this really, really important issue. I think if we're talking about the, the, the causes of sexual and gender-based violence, they are deeply rooted in South African society, in our, in our history, in our socioeconomic realities. And by that, I mean that we have this culture of violence uh, that's, that's so deeply rooted uh, in our history. Uh, we have a patriarchal society. We have an, uh, a greatly unequal society where I think power and control rests largely with men. Women are excluded from many aspects of society. Uh, women are often considered, the, women and children are considered the property of men. And, and so I think there's this, uh, this pervasive culture that underpins that. Uh, and 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 when you then have uh, on top of that or superimposed on that stressful circumstances, socioeconomic circumstances, it really just highlights and, and manifests in that particular way. But the the root causes really are are deep rooted uh, in our in our society. Uh, they will manifest in the workplace in things like sexual harassment that Nadine mentioned. They'll manifest in the domestic environment uh, in, in in so many different ways. Um, so it's really pervasive and it's going to, to permeate and contaminate every aspect of our society. Um, it, it appears to me also that we're, we're talking about a lot of systemic things, but as we discussed in the first episode of this, there is an element of personal responsibility to this. And, and I think each individual man who behaves badly, and behaves badly is the soft way I can say it, 
um, has to take some degree of responsibility for this too. We've also got laws that persecute and prosecute people who, who overstep the lines. And perhaps this is where you can come in, Nadine, because it doesn't seem like we have any systemic, you've got to, if you're going to say systemic problems exist, you've got to point to where. And otherwise it's really, we're just talking in platitudes and we're just trying to, to pass blame on and to externalize that problem. We have to point out which laws, we have to point out which people and we have to point out which businesses are doing these things. Otherwise, we're really talking in generalities and we're not looking for a solution. We're just making a big issue of things in order to assuage our own guilt. And I think we've got to take responsibility for that. Would you agree, Nadine? I would agree with that, um, Gareth. You, you know, there, there are laws in place in our country that place specific obligations on businesses. Um, and, you know, it does create further protections for individuals. So I think what's whilst you talk about systemic issue, this is sort of, it can be hindered and sort of influenced by our social structures. And a powerful structure for change is the workplace. On the one hand, you have the law requiring businesses to, they're obliged to take certain steps. They're obliged to provide certain assistance to victims. And on the other hand, you have this sort of moral argument that you you can have a despondent workforce, you can lose valuable employees, you can suffer, you know, reputational damage from a result of not dealing with the issue. Um, and it's, so as I, I agree that we have laws in place, also whether they're as far reaching as we would hope is, is another question. Um, I do understand that, you know, since the hashtag Me Too movement, the International Labour Organization introduced a convention on harassment and violence in work. Um, and it's recently been ratified by Fiji and Uruguay, whilst arguably South Africa should have been first in line. I think our president did state this past weekend that we're going to ratify it. And that's hope to bring a new standard to what employers should hold themselves to and to sort of not only change the laws, but provide additional responsibility to, to assist with this problem. But Hadmin, companies pick up the slack in almost every set of circumstances in South Africa where government has dropped the ball or where individuals are irresponsible. We have a huge problem with fatherlessness. We have the breakup of the traditional family for various reasons. And it somehow seems that it's up to businesses who exist really for profit, if you cut it down to the, the bone, and shareholders aren't particularly interested in social issues when they're investing in a business. Is it the job of business or a specific company to sort out major social ills. I know that in this country we all have to because everyone has to get stuck in and do their bit. But really, in the in in an ideal world, this should not be the business of business. Yeah, it absolutely should be. Uh, the time of companies focusing solely on profit is long gone. We come across almost no shareholders when we sit in our shareholder meetings. Um, I would say um, at least half of the conversation, and I mean at least half of the conversation, is about issues like climate change. They are fundamental yes, to the business. Because, and the, hang on. I mean, this is because people are forced to say no, these things. They, they, no. they, are, they are largely, it's completely um, unpopular and will get you thrown out of a meeting if you don't go along and nod your head approvingly with all of these things that people talk about. Of course, companies say them, but do they really mean them? And, and shareholders invest their money, not their sentiments. You know, I do think it used to be that way. I genuinely don't think that that is still the case. And you get two kinds of, of people, I think, fundamentally, when it comes to issues relating to sustainability. You get people who think it's the right thing to do, and then you get people who get a hard-nosed sort of business approach to it, who see the, the, the dollar signs. Uh, they see carbon taxes, for example, and then you see other people who, who, who see the future of their children and their grandchildren. And both of those scenarios have merit. I think a lot of investors now understand the science, for example, of climate change and, for example, the taxation that comes with it. So I can say 100% for certain that, say, for example, in the case of gender-based violence, they see those hard numbers that you've put out there. You cannot keep an engaged female workforce that brings with it 50% of the skills that you need in a skills-scarce environment and not see it as a hard money issue. So Cliff, can I uh, just come in there? Because I think that um, while one may be critical of somebody saying it's the right thing to do, there is a very strong business case to be made for that. Unhappy and unhealthy employees are not going to be productive. They're not going to be loyal. They're not going to give up their discretionary effort. 
and when organizations are making a concerted effort to look after the health and well-being and safety of their employees, uh, it will translate into the bottom line. This is not just a tears and tissue welfare, uh, welfare issue for, for organizations. It's something that does make a difference. So to, to say it simply sits in the realm of the right thing to do is often misguided. It, it will improve your bottom line if you, if you manage it. Uh, we, we, have, we have in this country a, a surplus of charities. I think we, we have for every charity that there is in, in a country of equivalent size and population, we have something like four for every other country's one. Uh, business is, is expected to do an enormous amount for society. And that's correct because we're obviously in a very unequal society, but that shouldn't be the main job of business. And for a lot of people, business is one of the few places where there are some simple supply and demand rules. So I'm playing devil's advocate because I know all of you are deeply involved in all of these issues. And it's always taken me by surprise that as much as this is a problem, it isn't the fault of or the responsibility of a business to solve the fact that one man in one household beats his woman. Surely, when even if she works for you or he works for you, surely there needs to be a focus again on personal responsibility. And this is where I think psychologically I'd like us to do an evaluation of how South African companies feel and why their staff are so victimized by people in the community, by people that they love. And we know that these the perpetrators of these these acts against women in South Africa are not strangers, right? We know that this take... happens with, of course. <laughs> Sorry, um, I, I got a little bit distracted by saying that I do believe that business has a strong role to play, um, but absolutely not the main role. Um, I, it's it's probably not a very um, a popular a politically correct statement, but. We, uh, we're stepping into a, a role that government should be playing, um, and it's pragmatic, right? Um, we're yeah. stepping further into the realm right. of government because government's not doing it. So let's not uh, dwell on what we should be doing. Let's dwell on what we have to do. Absolutely. That doesn't mean that other players don't have a role. Um, there's this issue of permissiveness that I think we need to think about. And if as the private sector, we start untangling that. We start a knock-on that's really important. So um, Nadine was talking a little bit earlier on about the, the, the legal system and how companies in South Africa have a positive duty, which is actually quite unique. So if we identify a case of harassment in a company, <coughs> excuse me, in South Africa, we have a legal duty to do something about it. Right. And if we start doing that in the world of work, we start showing people that we have a duty to do something. And the whole justice system in South Africa doesn't work. Something like, some people say seven and one, or one in seven cases get reported. Some people say one in 30 cases get reported. 50% of cases that get reported, actually 50% of the perpetrators get arrested. Roughly 50% of those cases actually get referred for prosecution. And roughly 50%, 50%, 50% down the line go to court, 50% eventually go through to some kind of finding. And then roughly 50% of those actually get a guilty finding. And for the most part, they get lighter sentences for then um, crimes of work. So the bottom line here is that if you, as a man, rape a woman or a child, you get away with it. So that's a culture of permissiveness. On top of that, if I know that an uncle is doing something to a child or a neighbor is doing something to his wife or a child, I keep quiet. So we have a culture of permissiveness. Yeah. As a company, we start doing something about that. We start breaking down that culture of permissiveness. That doesn't mean that we're the only ones who have a role to play. It means that we start playing that role and we start breaking that culture of permissiveness. I think that's hugely important. How do you go about doing that, though? Because it's not good enough, obviously, to just put up posters around the office saying, if you see something, say something. It requires quite a lot more intervention. Many people will, um, will block out much of the stuff that you're trying to help them achieve or trying to conscientize them to. Um, how, do you, how do you do that without 
again, overstepping the line because many people only are coming to work for a salary. They couldn't care less about some of this mm -hmm. stuff. They certainly don't want to be lectured by their company if they're not necessarily guilty of something. So you've got a fine balance to work here. And also you've got to try and make it an impact in ways that that properly improve people's lives. Uh, and, and that's hard. Um, you, you're not in the... You're not in the driving seat all the time, right, I mean, So it's tough. You've, you're expected to do much, and sometimes you're not really given the tools to do as much as you'd like. Well, expecting a certain behavior from people at work isn't lecturing. Okay, That's the law. And there's a difference between putting up a poster saying zero tolerance against gender-based violence at work and having a clear policy and a clear set of guidelines and behaviors that are expected at work. And enforcing them. If someone does something wrong, there are repercussions and they're consistent throughout, whether it's someone at the top or someone on the shop floor. And then when it comes to what happens in at home, for us, it's about making sure that we provide people who are victims of violence at home with the kind of support and leeway at work to help them navigate that process. Um, I had a uh, an experience recently with a, a colleague who was going through exactly that. So she was someone with a master's degree, um, so really, really educated. And it took her a week just to navigate how to go and report the case uh, and get a restraining order. All of that is a really, really complicated process. She had to take leave, so she had to find a way of keeping her son from... So, simply giving her that week of paid leave is immensely valuable right. as a very simple example. Yeah, what are the actual responsibilities, Nadine, that, that companies have to to do all of these things that Hermine says? And and according to the letter of the law, obviously you can't, you can take a horse to water, you can't make it drink. Many companies don't do as much as, as Anglo do under Hermine's guidance, but there are obviously certain requirements in legislation, in statute, in, in common law for companies, what are those? So I think, Gareth, any sort of employee that's that's facing this type of conduct needs to understand our legal framework. And South Africa has a zero tolerance approach to sexual harassment and violence in the workplace. It is an explicit form of unfair discrimination um, and has actually been described by our courts as the sort of most heinous misconduct that, that plagues the workplace. Mm -hmm. Practical guidance is provided by a code of good practice on the handling of sexual harassment um, right. cases. And what it actually provides is an employer, as my colleague alerted to, must have a sexual harassment policy in place, which sets out clear procedures to deal with sexual harassment in a sensitive, effective and efficient manner, and must also provide the necessary assistance to victims of such an act. When an uh, instance of sexual harassment is brought to your attention, you are under an obligation to immediately take action, which includes investigating the matter, consulting with relevant parties, and taking steps to, to eliminate the harassment. And, 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 and just by the way, the, the consequences of a company not going through any of this is that they themselves will be in, in, in legal hot water, correct? Yes, exactly. So just going back to your point as to why, why is it our business? Well, the very reason is that our law does create a vicarious liability for employment, mm. which means that if someone has suffered sexual harassment and you did not take steps to address it, you can be held vicariously liable um, and, and be held liable to pay damages or compensation. I mean, it was just last year that the Labour Appeal Court required the Liberty Group to pay a significant amount of damages to a victim on the basis that they failed to take the necessary steps. So there is um, financial costs here for, for employers, in addition to obviously your reputational damage and other soft soft issues that, that Andrew alluded to. So there are, yeah, there are significant laws in place. And just the one point I think it's important for employees to understand is what actually constitutes sexual harassment when you're talking about it in the workplace. It doesn't only refer to instances of violence or rape per se, it's actually any and welcome conduct of a sexual nature that, that violates the rights of employees and constitutes a barrier to equity in the workplace. All right. So it's so a this, this, is where I, I, this is where I need all, all of your help, please, because I feel that this is a very broad category and there are gradations of this. There are some which are much more serious than others. Obviously, there's some people, particularly, you know, gender activists who will say a word said in error 
is a kind of sexual harassment and so is rape. But very obviously there are gradations to this and there are punishments that must be, you know, in a criminal sense, accorded to the more serious crimes and that the others must be dealt with in other rep rep reparative ma uh, measures. So are we, are we in danger at all of lumping them all together in a category? And you know how we say sometimes that any discrimination or any kind of harassment is the same as any other kind of harassment. This is something which happens often. Uh, where people will say, oh, well, he was flirting with me and I did, was unwelcome. Um, this this can't be treated the same way as someone who has has violently sexually assaulted somebody, surely. But there are people who will argue that, that they're the same. They're in the same category and should be treated the same. If I may come in there, Gareth, I think that there certainly is a, a, a spectrum of severity. Again, I think that, that part of the difficulty that we deal with as psychologists is really uh, people's attitudes and perceptions. Um, there's, a, there's, there's an obvious consensus that somebody forcing themselves on another individual in a violent way in the work environment is not okay. But there, sure. at the other ends of the spectrum, um, people's attitudes on why they would choose to employ a male over a female because uh, he doesn't have to bear children um, you know, that it's okay to deal with, uh, to show uh, uh, naked pictures to a female employee. Um, a lot of that has to do with, with a, a person's own attitudes and beliefs about what's okay, what's correct, that I'm perfectly entitled to make those kind of decisions. And I think that's, that often underlies um, some of the concerns that, we, that we're talking about, not the, the obvious end of the spectrum where someone is, 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 is brutalized or, or badly treated that is so obviously illegal. It's the more subtle side. And, and that education and awareness does become important, to be aware of our own unconscious biases and how that might manifest. And then when you're in a situation where um, that's amplified by, by distress, um, and stressful conditions that we start to see it manifest in, in, in uglier ways. Well, let's talk about some of those things at the, at the much more blurry end of the spectrum, because I'm sure that in your experience, all three of you have, have come across cases where something has been observed by one party to be egregious and harmful, and yet by the opposing party, it's seen as trivial and silly and not necessarily worthy of of company interference or company action. How do you draw that line? Uh, it must be very, very hard for people in the positions that that certainly you do, you occupy, I mean, to be able to decide how the company should react to any and all of these. We've seen numerous examples too of where there is almost a reciprocal consent given for a certain level of intimacy, and then that can be withdrawn at any moment leaving both parties quite confused as to whether or not there's been an overstepping of boundaries. I think you all know what I mean. Yeah, I, I think that in all walks of life, this issue of consent being something that is given on, needs to be constantly given an ongoing as basis. something that is, yeah. But what I find on in, in, in mining uh, that happens very often is this this sort of don't be a sissy or you're taking something too seriously or it was a joke. Um, you, you find women often referred to as girls and I'm talking about sort of 40 plus women with PhDs. Um, and you, when, when you mention it, it's, you know, don't be so soft. If you, if you, wanna, work, if you wanna work in mining, you, um, you're gonna have to man up because this is a man's world. And, and people just don't understand why that kind of language is problematic. Whereas I can guarantee you that if you were to call um, an adult man a boy, they'd get that and, and, and yet turn it around. That's not understood. And it's that kind of micro stuff that, that people just don't understand. But, but is, is it that micro stuff? Because again, we're, we're in danger of going into generalities here where we turn something which is extremely dangerous mm. into a trivial thing just by making a trivial thing dangerous in words. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I do know what you mean. And, and that's exactly to the point you're, you're talking about you know earlier I mean? on. I, I'll, I'll make this personal for a second because I, there was a magazine that, that once said that I was a misogynist for making a joke about Adele being overweight. 
a misogynist. Now, a misogynist is someone who hates women, you know, and I've made many jokes about men and women and, and to not focus too much on my story, but the fact that that word is so willy nilly applied to both the ridiculous, which is someone making a joke, it's ridiculous, no matter how you want to look at it, and the very serious aspects of men who go around in this country actually forcing themselves on women and that they're all put in the same category is kind of crazy. And I feel in the workplace, this sometimes might happen to the detriment of the real victims. Because I don't really, the perpetrator here must face the music. I think we all agree with, with that. But, I think but if, if it's unclear, as, as in an example of, you know, a, a woman flirting with a man at work and then changing her mind and suddenly he's accused of something. I'd like to think, yeah, look, I'd like to think that 99% of people know what's right and wrong. In, in preschool, we learn about good touching and bad touching. And when we hug our colleagues, and I hug my colleagues often, we know that barrier and that boundary between what's okay and what's yeah. not okay. And out of interest in at Anglo American, our policy is a bullying, harassment, and victimization policy. Because very often these behaviors yeah. are linked. And very yeah. often people will <clears throat> call out something that is maybe a little bit unkind, like calling someone fat. And yeah. um, with something else that might be a little bit different. And yes, it is incredibly unhelpful to call something that is maybe a little bit rude, racist or sexist, yeah. because it undermines all of those other things that are right. incredibly serious. And yes, there's a spectrum of behaviors and they all need to be addressed in some way or another if they're not constructive in the world of work. Gareth, um, Andrew, you, you wanted to say something? Thank you, yes, and, and perhaps it sits more in, in, in Nadine's sphere, but, but certainly in our experience, I think the responsibility of the workplace um, is to take the matter seriously, and that's part of what we're trying to do, that uh, if there is an allegation of um, harassment or bullying that it needs to be taken seriously and not dismissed, which is often what we see, where someone has been subject to something that really isn't okay, goes to their line manager and the manager say, oh, uh, Carl would never do that, um, you know, leave it, leave it alone. It needs to be taken seriously. There's always and, um, the, the, the risk that it's a false allegation, but I think that's when you have a, a harassment policy that says if it's taken seriously, there will be a disciplinary that follows and the person would be then subject to scrutiny and found to be guilty or not guilty. The problem that I think we see in many organizations that don't have that appropriate policy that Nadine was referring to is that so often um, matters anywhere on the spectrum are very, very easily dismissed. The person that's made the allegation is then um, uh, vulnerable to, to ongoing victimization and often ends up leaving the organization. So the same thing in, in, in your particular case, hopefully that's subject to some kind of scrutiny and, um, and you judged accordingly and not automatically that if somebody puts up their hand and says, I'm a victim of bullying or racism, that, they, that automatically stands. Uh, if you've got a good policy in place and a procedure that follows that, uh, that should be implemented. It's when that's ignored and dismissed that I think we start to see these types of problems bubbling under um, and you get a, a toxic kind of culture in the workplace. I want to get to a question from Stacy in a second, but Nadine, I, I know you've got something to say about that. I also just want to add in before you answer this, because there's, there's a part of it I'd like you to, to add to your answer. Some of these processes, though, are very onerous and time consuming and difficult. And, and occasionally doing an investigation requires an enormous amount of time, resources and effort. And sometimes people want, because in every aspect of our lives now, we're, we think we're entitled to instant gratification. We just want to know, is this person guilty or is, is, there, a, is there a real allegation going on? What is the level of the, of the harm done? People almost want it to be delivered like that. And that's not how justice or investigation works, right? Yes, no, that's right, Gareth. I just want to touch briefly on um, the previous subject matter. Interesting now, law actually provides a test for employers to determine whether an act constitutes sexual harassment in the workplace. And there is a number of factors they must take into place, but one of them is the impact it has on an individual. So there is no objective list of what constitutes sexual harassment. It really is a subjective inquiry as to whether an individual's dignity was impacted. You could say to a female in the workplace, 
sure, you know, your, your legs look nice in those pants. One female may take that as a compliment and think great. Another one may view that as sexual harassment. And you really need to take a subjective approach to understand that effect. But, that's that's, that's, but you, you know, as a lawyer, that that is a very difficult test to try and push down on a society because you're going to have people who have different opinions, both from the point of view of the person who's saying that thing about the legs and the person who's receiving the either compliment or insult to their dignity. Um, we, we need to have equal rules for everybody. And, and that's difficult when it's so subjective. No, it is, it is difficult, but it goes against to the fact that you can't lump all actions into this one category of gender-based violence or, or sexual harassment. Um, you do need to consider, you know, are there minor instances, are there more serious instances? And that goes to your question of your investigation. You know, our law does recognize in more minor instances of sexual harassment, it may be a more informal process as followed, where you sort of engage with the perpetrator and just have a conversation about how their conduct's inappropriate to constitute sexual harassment. Yes, there are more serious cases where you do have to conduct an investigation. Um, Gareth, I appreciate this is work, and often you are confronted with a he said, she said scenario, um, and you really can't tell who is telling the truth. And, and this it, becomes, is why it becomes costly when we have to hire you, Nadine, to, to help us sort it out. <laughs> I mean, because you're an expert, we can't do it on our own, and sometimes these things are very, very important, need to be resolved by experts, not just by people sitting down around a table having a conversation about it. No, completely, Gareth. And, and one of the points that Andrew alerted to is our clients and employers have actually faced a number of false allegations of sexual harassment. Um, and, you know, not only does this undermine the seriousness of sexual harassment, it can have a fatal effect for an accused sort of professional career and personal life. Um, so in these instances, this is why investigations are required. Um, it can't simply be quickly making a determination. Um, you can be at risk of a claim of defamation um, as a result. So, so it's not only, you know, as Andrew alluded to, it's important to discourage your employees to not make false claims, that it does constitute misconduct, but also training your staff to, to know how to properly investigate matters, to, to cross-examine witnesses. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I go to some of the questions? And by, by the way, anyone who's who's joined us for this webinar, please, if you have questions, you're more than welcome to send them into us now. I have refreshed the screen. I'd be happy to hear what your input is. And if you have something in particular that you'd like to ask a panelist, please bring that. Uh, Stacy says, I think in response to something you said earlier, I mean, it is also a unilateral thing. So if I'm being referred to as a girl, I need to stand up for myself and say to the CEO, it's not OK to talk to me like that. Uh, personal agency is important, but of course, not everybody has, just in the, as in the case that was just outlined by Nadine of how everybody takes a set of words a different way. Not everybody has the same level of, of confidence or of, of, of agency, and, and clearly that's part of the problem too, right? Yeah, it is, and, and it's also probably a little bit unfair to, to put so much responsibility on the victim. In, in South Africa, there aren't a lot of jobs going around it and you stand a real, people. yeah, you stand a real risk of, of losing your job. So, so yes, if you can speak out, um, try and speak right, to I HR. don't know about that. It's very hard to fire people in this country. Yeah, but as Andrew was saying, a lot of victims leave because of the victimization that they suffer. So, so yeah, it's difficult to fire people, but people often just leave because life is made so difficult for them. So, so all I'm trying to say is if you don't speak out, don't feel like a loser, but if you can, absolutely try. Uh, if I could come in there, Cl Cliff, um, just in relation to linking the two things that uh, Nadine spoke about training, I think uh, it's, it's, it's not only the responsibility of expensive external consultants to resolve these issues. Part of what organizations like APSA are doing is raising awareness and educating managers. This is a line responsibility. Um, it, a, a line manager can't just wash themselves, their hands of, of responsibility for dealing with these issues. They need to be aware of it. They need to have, um, you know, demonstrate that if people do have issues, they can be spoken about, they will be taken seriously, or they will be dealt with there. It's not as if it's, it's simply either um, dealt with by a, a um, expensive ex external person or, or um, the IR department. It can be managed at a, um, at a, and it should be managed at a, at a responsible line 
Uh, I have a question from Sarah, which I think is for Nadine to have a go at. Where should we start when looking for some guidelines around policy in the workplace so that we can get this policy into our business and ensure it protects our team? I feel it should apply to women and to men. Where, where would you go if you'd started a business? Um, I know many people who start a small business and really at the, at the end of their list of things that they're worried about because there are important things like cash flow and, you know, uh, minimum viable product and all those kinds of things, which otherwise you don't have a business. HR policy and sexual harassment policy really comes at the end of their list of priorities. So where do they go to find a, a solution that protects their staff, that protects them, and that will allow them to commence with business as soon as possible without being stuck in the reeds of just starting it? Thanks, Gareth. Um, they should seek legal advice. <laughs> Um, but but more than that, a policy is a requirement by law, so it shouldn't be the, the end of your list. Um, it should actually be one of your strategic decisions as a company. And where you can start is seeking guidance from our code of handling of sexual harassment. So it's actually supposed to, your policy is supposed to align with the code. And the code is very user friendly, it provides very clear guidance, and a lot of employers actually just incorporate the code in a policy. Um, which which helps them going forward. So that, I would say, is the first port of action. And then, of course, looking at, as we've discussed, your Convention on Harassment and Violence and Work and what steps that suggests to to address it and, and you know, what relief you have to afford employers. But it just shouldn't be your, your last requirement. It is a compliant, you know, it is a legal issue um, of compliance. And similar to registering a business with the CIPC or registering with SARS, it is you know, it can have consequences if you do fail to have a policy in place. Right. Uh, you wanted to add something there, Hadmin, or, or not? Okay, we've got more questions. So I'd, I'd love to hear from you if you have one or two of these questions. Derek says, a Zulu speaking female employee once explained to me that it is expected from men to whistle at her when she's walking past. It's seen as a compliment. That's complicated in the workplace, obviously. How do you deal with that? And we do have many cultural complications which make all of this bureaucratic and well-intentioned paperwork seem almost ineffectual when we have cultures where there are different ways of the the sexes dealing with each other there are different ways for people of a certain age to deal with people of a different age this is all stuff we can't ignore now, it's inconvenient stuff for you know a multicultural society but it must be dealt with right I, I, you know, I think the key point that was mentioned yeah. earlier. None of you, I, I just want to point out, none of you jumped in on that one because it's that <laughs> old. But Andrew, you go ahead. <laughs> I, I think the key point that's being missed there is something that is 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 unwanted sexual attention um, by the individual uh, that that is distressing and and uh, interferes with that individual. I, I, I think cultural issues shouldn't be used as as an excuse for. Um, uh, for harassment. The, yes. the fact is, if it's something Andrew, that is distressing. And, yeah. Andrew, you don't know that a priori. Nobody knows that a priori. The, yeah. the, the, the victim, before they're a victim, doesn't know that, and neither does the perpetrator. It only happens in the instance of the act. Yeah. I, I've got a view, Andrew. Okay. I don't know if you're done. Oh, go ahead. Um, so when I refer to the girl example, I've often found that it's Afrikaans men who will refer to to women as Macy or girl and in in some cases it's been women who are younger sometimes not and you know there is the Afrikaans uh, sort of hierarchical um, dani, depending on who's younger or who's older um, that said I've called out many men and you can do it in a gentle way and said listen it's just not appropriate at work to, to apply that worm tani thing or my and thing. And people continue to do it. So once you've educated someone and given a logical reason for it and pointed out that there's the law and that there's workplace convention and people continue to do it, it then becomes problematic because they are disregarding what the law and what has been presented to them as logic and an explanation. I think it's a very good example, but that one comes from almost an oversupply of politeness in Wurmantani. When you're young, you're taught to say that in Afrikaans culture. It's almost 
much more galling when it's the other way around, when it comes from a complete lack of politeness, when it comes from people who've essentially been raised by wolves, who are saying outrageous things in the workplace that are completely unacceptable. And, and the stuff that Andrew was saying earlier about people like showing naked pictures and the rest of it, just not having been raised properly. And we have an abundance of that in South Africa too. Yes, I think the point that I'm making in relation to that is that it's it's um, the concern that we have when people are sometimes taken to task is, well, what was so wrong with that? Uh, I think it does go to attitudes and beliefs. There are obvious, obvious situations where people know that it's wrong and they're taking a, a chance, but in, in many instances it does relate to our own views, our own biases and attitudes that, uh, that, that people have in the way in which they see women. And I think that's 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 at the, the heart of, of, of some of the difficulties and challenges that we have. The two questions here, which I'm going to try and lump together, even though it's going to be a bit of a stretch. Uh, Stobile says, who are the best people or professionals in an organization to conduct the investigations that Nadine was referring to? Because obviously there are people in particular offices, but there might be people who are more well equipped because they understand maybe maybe you don't have a, a man doing the investigation. You need a woman sometimes. Uh, perhaps it's a there's a language element to it. Perhaps there's a cultural element to it. That's a very, very good question, uh, Stobile. And then uh, Lulama saying that that is not true. It is not not culturally Zulu. Well, Lulama, I mean, I, you're not the queen of the Zulu as far as I know, but this is the problem with culture too. Is some people assume that it's part of their culture when it's actually just bad behavior. And some people assume that it's bad behavior when it is part of their culture. So we don't know these things. It's not a numerous clauses of problems. Am I, am I right there? And, and Nadine, you pick up on that, that issue of who should deal with these investigations. Sure, um, Gareth, I agree with all your points that you made in relation to um, investigators. There doesn't have to be a specific department or person that's designated as the investigator. And the reason why I say this is because you need to ensure that the investigator that is appointed is not biased, does not have any knowledge of the matter. So they can remain as neutral as possible and can investigate it from an outside sort of third party perspective. Um, it can be in your HR department, of course, which many companies do, do place their investigators, but it can be Another organization, if you're in a multi-jurisdictional sort of um, scenario or group company, you can appoint someone from a completely different office to avoid, you know, any any sort of knowledge of the event. And most importantly, limiting who you share this information with. Our law does require individuals to, to keep confidential the identities of persons involved in the investigation, and it's for the very reason of false claims being made. Um, so, so to limit the individuals you inform to only sort of the investigator and the, the specific individuals helping with any disciplinary process. That's such an important point that I hadn't thought of. I'm glad you brought it up, is that there's a confidentiality, confidentiality aspect to this, which obviously protects all the individuals until there is a finding. And, and at that point, how public can you go as a company and what are you required to do again? Because there's almost a responsibility you know, that passivity, frankly, that Hermin was talking about earlier, which we, we shouldn't be allowing to carry on without any any breaks in society. We shouldn't allow this passivity of, 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 of consent or of uh, acceptability in society to, to make the way. We should actually have something when a company has found someone to be horribly out of step with their conventions and with policy. We should have some way of letting pub the public know that we've we've acted properly as company A or company B. I mean, Gareth, you, you would have seen the sort of name and shame approach that has been adopted to sort of gender-based violence since the hashtag Me Too campaign with, you know, individuals sort of exposing people on social media platforms. Harvey Weinstein, that kind of thing, yeah. I mean, recently in our own entertainment industry, we had your actress Lorraine Moropa that came forward and discussed and that, you know, the accuser there was actually identified and has similarly come forward to deny the allegations. Um, but it is an issue where confidentiality isn't maintained because number one, it should be treated as a sort of form of misconduct just because of the risk associated with it. It is your personal information, which we now have this new legislation dealing with personal information and how it can be processed. But it also doesn't mean an organization cannot inform 
their, their employers should say. There has been sexual harassment in the workplace or, or gender-based violence. We, are, we do take it seriously. We're reminding you that these are the rules that are in place and that in, you know, any sort of activity will be taken seriously, as opposed to saying the specific person's name. Yeah. Andrew, where do you think we're going? Do you think we're heading in the right direction? We, we're, we're constantly being forced to look very hard in the mirror and realize that we're, we've got a long way to go. But are you, are you seeing hopeful signs that we're, we're getting better at dealing with these, these horrible issues in not just the workplace, but in society? So I would separate those two, um, Gareth. I, I do think that there are certain organizations that will adopt best practice uh, approaches to it where we are making progress. I do think within our education system and our society as a whole, uh, putting sexual harassment and gender-based violence issues on the agenda and highlighting them uh, can only assist us. We are becoming more aware of a society of, of these challenges. I think we've got a, a long way to go, and I think the statistics really show that. We, we, it's an abominable situation at the moment, and a lot still needs to be done. Also, I think a number of the factors that really drive these types of issues uh, you know, remain prevalent in our society, gross inequality, uh, poverty, etc. So there's a, there's a lot still to do, um, but I, I think there are islands and areas where, where, where things are progressing and things are being done and, and where initiatives to, to empower women and help men to understand the role that they play in this, uh, you know, are, are making some progress. That's hopeful. Um, Hermine, in the fourth industrial revolution, which we hear a lot about in, in company speak, um, it, it appears that more and more women are, and particularly a, a, an area like mining, and this is where you can give us some insight, women are taking on jobs that before were exclusively masculine. They're driving monstrous trucks and, and drilling un underground and doing things that really prove that there shouldn't be any kind of discrimination on the basis of gender in the workplace. But, but are we seeing that in numbers that are surprising, or is it still a minority of women who choose to do those kinds of occupations? Um, I, I think, uh, so, so yes, currently a minority, but I, I think that there's a revolution coming in the number of women because it's not that they're driving the trucks and it's not like they're driv drilling underground. It's that they're drilling remotely. It's they're driving the trucks remotely. <coughs> they're in control rooms. And they're in the, the, it's not only that the, the, the drills are lighter, it's machines doing it. It's machines that can do it. So um, the the shifts are different. The machinery is completely different. So it literally does not matter who does it. In fact, I, I suspect my son might be able to do it. Um, so it's a it's going to be a revolution. It's very very interesting stuff. I want to go to one last question uh, from Pavel. Pavel says, despite the legal obligation to report an incident or alleged incident, how do you handle the situation where the abused does not want you as the line manager to do anything about it, be it for fear of backlash or shame or whatever? They raise it with you just to let you know, but the affected employee wants you to respect their right to be silent on the matter. Complicated. Sure. I mean, Gareth, just in terms of our law on that point. You are required to inform employees about their options of a formal or informal procedure. And as you said, you may get victims or complainants that don't want you to follow procedure, but it is not the victim say so. An employer is required to take steps to, to sort of understand the risk to other people in the workplace as a result of the sexual harassment, whether it was of a serious nature, whether the perpetrator has a history of sexual harassment. And if there is, a significant risk to harm to others in the workplace. They can follow a procedure irrespective of the wishes of the victim and the complainant, but the, the victim and complainant must be advised accordingly. That's interesting stuff too. Um, I, I think we're- remain confidential. Yes. I, I think we're unfortunately at the end of this and, and I'm, I'm absolutely, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to have had the time to spend with all of you. I, I didn't give you an easy ride because there are lots of these things that are difficult to talk about. And I didn't bring you here so we could all have a kumbaya and say how much we're doing about gender-based violence. The questions that we've answered, I hope, have gone some way to a, 
acknowledge and to take seriously some of the much more deep-seated problems. Uh, we, we only scratched the surface today, and I, I believe that many more of these will be, will be had before we'll make the kind of progress that I think any of the four of us or any of our attendees today would like to see done. But I'd, I'd very much like to thank all of you for your time, your expertise, uh, your incredible insights today, and I do hope that we'll all meet again to pick up the next chapter of this of this conversation. You've all been really terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Such a pleasure being here. Thank you. And a big thank you to everyone who's joined us as attendees today. We had uh, some very very big numbers, which is great. You know, big numbers. Donald Trump likes big numbers. We like. Big numbers. <laughs> so if if you um, if you came along hoping for something to be answered and wasn't. Um, I have good news for you. We still have a, a, a couple of episodes of this, and, and we're going to hopefully have many more discussions around an issue which is so important to us in South Africa. Um, and Absa, well done for getting behind an issue of such import. And I think that we only, um, we're only really starting to get to grips with these things now in 2020 when they've been issues for humanity for thousands and thousands of years. So at least we can claim as this generation, <laughs> we're getting our hands dirty, which is good. Um, I thank you all very much for your attendance and we will, we will reconvene soon. If you need to catch up on anything you missed in this webinar, we will make it available and uh, it'll be in video and in podcast. Thank you very, very much and have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you.